History is nothing but the progress of the consciousness of freedom. Meditate on that thought for a bit. Let that thought marinate in your mind for a bit. History is nothing but the progress of the consciousness of freedom. There is nothing in the world more precious to human beings than freedom. Since the dawn of consciousness and the realization of the fact that we are aware of our own existence, freedom is positioned at the epicenter of our experience. Throughout time, the notion of freedom has evolved in tandem with the state of the human condition. Hence, history is nothing but the progress of the consciousness of freedom. And there was one person who realized that more than others and made it the nucleus of his thinking. That person was Georg Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel. He is considered one of the founding figures of modern Western philosophy, and many say that no philosopher of the 19th or 20th centuries has had as great an impact on the world as Hegel. He has been quite an enigmatic figure for me since I first heard his name. Most say that his writing style is obscure and even repulsive at times. Regardless, I thought it was about time to demystify this legendary figure and understand why his work is considered so impactful and uh, unique. Hegel was born on 27 August uh, 1770 in Stuttgart, uh, capital of the Duchy of Wittenberg in Germany. His father was secretary to the revenue office of the Duke of uh, Wittenberg. His mother was the daughter of a lawyer. He had a brother and a sister. During his childhood, uh, he developed a huge appetite for reading, especially for writers associated with the Enlightenment. At the age of 18, he entered the Protestant school of the time, where he had as roommates the future philosophers Hölderlin and Schelling. He admired uh, greatly the Greek civilization and became obsessed with the French Revolution. In 1801, Hegel moved uh, to the city of Jena in Germany after the encouragement of his friend uh, Schelling, who was already a professor at the University of the City. There he started writing his most famous book, The Phenomenology of Spirit. It was a very dense philosophical work that attempted uh, to build a science of consciousness, so to speak. Hegel wanted to explain the evolution of consciousness from childhood and basic awareness to uh, self-awareness and absolute knowledge. It was published in 1807. A very interesting incident in Hegel's life occurred in 1806 when Napoleon uh, marched in the city of uh, Jena one day before the battle between the French and the Prussian troops uh, outside the city. Hegel wrote in a letter about his encounter with the Emperor. I saw the Emperor, this world soul, riding out of the city on reconnaissance. It is indeed a wonderful sensation to see such an individual who concentrated here at a single point astride the horse, reaches out of the world and masters it, this extraordinary man whom it is impossible not to admire. In 1811, Hegel married uh, Marie Helena Susanna von Tucher. This period saw the publication of his second major work, The Science of Logic, and the birth of two sons, Carl Friedrich Wilhelm and Immanuel Thomas Christian. In 1818, Hegel accepted an offer of the Chair of Philosophy at the University of Berlin, where he stayed until his death in 1831. His last words are said to have been, There was only one man who ever understood me, and even he didn't understand me. What is history, really? Could you define history in one sentence? The great historian Timothy Snyder, in one of his recent uh, lectures on the war in Ukraine, said the following. Um, so history is about change of continuity, which means it's about ends and beginnings, and it also, it's also about unpredictability. It is true. History is change and continuity. I would go one step further and say that history is change, continuity and evolution. Throughout history there was one philosopher who quite adamantly supported this idea, Wilhelm Hegel. And this is depicted in a series of lectures he gave at the University of Berlin in 1822, 1828 and 1830, titled Lectures on the Philosophy of History. Upon reading some of the text and mainly analysis of the text, I realized that I was a Hegelian since a long time without even knowing. Hegel in the Philosophy of History sets out to explain something groundbreaking and visceral for the human psyche. He tries to present history as a very sophisticated process that moves towards a very specific goal, the realization and cultivation of human freedom. As he says, the question at issue is therefore the ultimate end of mankind, the end which the spirit sets itself in the world. What does that even mean? 
What does it mean for the spirit to set itself in the world? The translation is not the best, but it roughly means for the human spirit to realize its existence and self-actualize. Hegel uses the word Geist in German, which most people translate as uh, spirit. With the word Geist, he doesn't allude uh, to something metaphysical, but rather to everything that allows us to evolve our inner world, the mind, the intellect, the soul. He has envisioned the end state of mankind as a very enlightened uh, state where the human spirit has reached the state of self-actualization through a continuous development of reason, knowledge and examination of history. For him, history plays a fundamental role in this process and it is the task of philosophy to comprehend and define its place during the unfolding of history. Hegel's philosophy of history has a lot of uh, historical information. It can be viewed as a brief outline of parts uh, of world history from the early civilizations of China, India and uh, Persia through ancient Greece to Roman times and then tracing the path of European history from feudalism to the Reformation and on to the Enlightenment and the French uh, Revolution. He begins with what he calls the Oriental world, meaning mainly China, India and Persia. A common pattern identified in these three cultures is that only one person, the ruler, is a free individual. The rest of the population is lacking in freedom because they must follow mostly blindly the rule of the head of their culture. And this subordination is not only a matter of law, but also a matter of how morality operates within these cultures. China is organized on the idea of family. The emperor is the father and others see themselves as children of the state. Obedience to one's own parents is a matter of honor. India is organized on the concept of castes. Castes are social classes and someone is born into them. If you adhere to this system, your life is defined by something exogenous and unchangeable. Persia was a theocratic monarchy, meaning that the emperor was blessed by the religion of the time. The predominant religion of the time was Zoroastrianism. The problem with all three cultures is that the concept of individual conscience is absent. Individuals cannot form their own judgment about right or wrong and about their self-worth. These judgments are usually orchestrated by external powers. Hegel then contrasts uh, the Persian culture to the Greek one and sees the fight between the Persians and the Greeks as a fight between despotism and individual freedom. So this was a pivotal point in history and the fact that the Greeks won plays a huge part in the development of uh, history and freedom. When the Romans uh, dominated the world, although the Roman Empire was governed by an emperor, the idea of individual freedom was still prevalent. In Rome there is a constant uh, tension between the absolute power of the state and the idea of individuality. Then came Christianity. Christianity allowed humans to see themselves as spiritual beings and this changed almost everything. The Christian religion has this special element according to Hegel because Jesus Christ was both a human and the son of God. This is a great lesson for human development because it allows humans to break through the limits of the material world and realize within themselves an infinite value and divine destiny since they are made in the image of God. The result is the development of what Hegel calls religious self-consciousness. As he writes, the German nations, under the influence of Christianity, were the first to attain the consciousness that man as man is free. That is the freedom of a spirit which constitutes its essence. Christianity was the epicenter of the intellectual life in the Middle Ages. However, due to the darkness surrounding that period, Hegel perceived medieval Christianity as the facilitator of a form of consciousness that was unhappy and cruel. According to philosopher Peter Singer, it took a particular world historical moment, namely the French Revolution, for spirit to become truly self-conscious, to escape abstract freedom and realize concrete freedom through the laws as they applied to the people. Even near the end of his life, Hegel remained uh, jubilant about the French Revolution, describing it as a glorious mental dawn. The spirit of the world develops throughout history by realizing the struggle with itself. Every stage in world history acts uh, as a stepping stone for the next one. For Hegel, world history is influenced by world historical individuals, uh, so-called great men, such as Socrates, uh, Julius Caesar and uh, Napoleon. They act as archetypes that influence the tides of history and represent the need for freedom. He sees these figures as embodiments of the progress of humanity to reach a certain point in history. 
a point where the notion of freedom is expressed in different ways. It is crucial to understand that Hegel doesn't merely want to show that the amount of freedom has increased over the course of history, but that the concept of freedom itself has fundamentally changed and realized its importance. This process is a result of a thesis colliding with an antithesis and eventually forming a synthesis. Hegel didn't use these specific terms. He used the terms abstract, negative, concrete, but most scholars use the terms uh, thesis, antithesis, synthesis because they are less ambiguous. Thesis is the status quo of the time that doesn't really serve the need for freedom. An antithesis is formed and revolts against the thesis. The result is the synthesis of the two that usually leads to more freedom. That's right. And the goal for Hegel is the greater development of mind towards freedom. We are moving always towards consciousness of freedom, towards realizing human freedom and understanding freedom. And that is a process of increasing awareness of freedom and of increasing knowledge of ourselves. Freedom essentially means to act as we please, but acting as we please has way too many implications when the individual operates within a social system. Freedom is contingent on our needs and desires, but where do our desires and needs come from? Some are organic and some are constructed. Constructed needs are byproducts of our systems. In capitalism, we have an obsession with growth. We deem growth as a necessary constituent of our systems. Without growth, we head uh, towards stagnation, and stagnation is not good for our well-being. So capitalism artificially creates needs and desires that accelerate growth. We might not need that uh, new car or new shirt, but we see other people buying new things, and we do the same. Regardless of what capitalism does to affect human behavior, it is difficult to distinguish the preferences that contribute to genuine human welfare from those that do not. It is challenging to put a label on the word comfort because it can be molded according to the circumstances of a certain period and people can manipulate the term to make a profit off of it. This remark occurs in a section of the philosophy of right that examines what Hegel calls the system of needs. Hegel constantly identifies that our needs and desires are shaped by our social systems and the social systems in turn are stages in a historical process. What is the role of the individual in this process? Is there any amount of free will in that? Or are we just being led by social and historical forces? Hegel's answer to this is straightforward. We are free when we reason. We are not free when we act from particular innate or socially conditioned desires. We are free when we reason and then act. The process of reasoning is not an easy one, thus freedom is not so easy to acquire. Reason develops through reasoning and dialogue, and Hegel puts a special emphasis on the way Socrates was reasoning in Plato's uh, dialogues. Extrapolating from this and trying to analyze this argument through the prism of world history, I feel that in the current day and age, we are the closest we have ever been in making reason a fundamental part of our reality. Polyphony and uh, plurality of channels through which many voices can collide and uh, merge is a healthy process despite the tension that creates between us. Even if some voices are unreasonable and cacophonous, we eventually reach uh, reason via the method of thesis, antithesis and uh, synthesis. The idea of spirit, in German Geist, it's central to Hegel's philosophy. It's he central to his conception of reasoning, to his conception of history, to the big topics in Hegel's thinking. Now, Geist is translated in, German, in English as spirit. It's the part of the world, the part of that which is, which isn't nature, which isn't matter, or isn't exclusively matter, isn't exclusively physical. It's the part of the world that isn't the tables and chairs, the animals and plants, simple brute matter. Geist is, exact, is exactly everything that isn't nature. The notion of the spirit occupied Hegel's thought mainly in his magnus opus, The Phenomenology of Spirit. Just by reading its title, the book strikes the potential reader as something quite formidable. Let's start with an explanation of the word phenomenology. 
The Oxford English Dictionary tells us that phenomenology means the science of phenomena as distinct from that of being. Phenomena is a Greek word that means appearances. So the distinction between phenomena and being is the distinction between things as they appear to us and as they really are. That is a mind-bending argument and we need to understand that Hegel made this argument because he was an idealist, that is, he believes that reality is a mental construct. Reality cannot exist independently from the mind, everything is constructed in the mind. So a phenomenology of spirit will be a study of the way in which mind or spirit appears to us. In the book, Hegel analyzes different forms of consciousness and showing how more limited forms of consciousness necessarily develop into more adequate ones throughout time until we reach absolute knowledge. But what is absolute knowledge? That's one of the greatest philosophical questions and one I'm still not sure if I'm able to answer after reading the book and multiple analysis of the book. I will attempt a brief interpretation though. Reality is created in our mind. At first, mind does not realize this. At first, the mind perceives reality as something external, something independent. It tries to understand it, but conceives it as something elusive. But when it comes face to face with the fact that reality is its own creation, then it understands that there is nothing beyond itself. The mind becomes one with reality and, as Hegel puts it in the concluding section of the phenomenology, absolute knowledge is mind knowing itself in the shape of mind. Essentially, he's talking about self-awareness, self-actualization and spiritual enlightenment. The more we develop our cognitive capacity, the more enlightened we become and this is manifested in the form of self-awareness, art, philosophy, science, morality and coexistence of uh, cultures. In any case, this was an attempt to briefly describe a very dense topic. Obviously, the book consists of numerous echelons that need to be visited independently in order to decode every level of Hegelian thought. Hegel writes about reason, religion, pleasure, necessity, culture and much more. Despite the difficulty in interpreting him, he remains one of the greatest philosophers in history and influenced thinkers like Marx, Nietzsche, Heidegger, Foucault and Zizek. I like to call Hegel the philosopher of nothing and everything. It seems that when you read him, you understand nothing. But if you invest the time to investigate him deeper, you can come very close to understanding almost everything about the human condition. I will leave you with a very powerful passage from one of his early writings, uh, promoted a lot by Slavoj Žižek. The human being is this night, this empty nothing, that contains everything in its uh, simplicity. An unending wealth of many representations, images of which none belongs to him, or which are not present. One catches sight of this night when one looks human beings in the eye, into a night that becomes awful.